Uh, this morning, it is my very privileged job to steer several sessions, in fact, throughout the day, on the theme of science and policy. This is the first of three. Um, I'm not going to take too much of your time because we have quite a packed agenda, lots of speakers with lots of very interesting things to say about this very, very apt and very prescient topic of the interface of science and policies. The first speaker will be David McConnell, Professor David McConnell, who is a molecular geneticist at Trinity College Dublin, a pioneer of genetic engineering in Ireland, and currently, among many things, I noticed in his bio that he's a member, in fact, the chairman of the Irish Times Trust, which must be a completely interesting job. So without any more ado, David McConnell. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and it's uh, wonderful to be uh, back uh, at the New Library of Alexandria and to see so many friends as well already. Uh, I was the chairman of the Irish Times Trust, uh, but uh, when I became chairman, uh, I changed the rules which said you have to retire after 10 years, so I'm no longer the chairman. I want to talk today about science uh, and policy and serving of society and to take as a case uh, study uh, my own country, which became independent in 1922. Uh, when I was a, a student at school, I thought that science could change Ireland. It has taken a very long time, but we've uh, begun to change the country. Uh, it's a very small country, only 32,000 square miles. Uh, it's partitioned into two parts, the Republic of Ireland in the south, and, which is independent, and Northern Ireland, which has six counties in the north, which is part of the United Kingdom. Uh, it's... Um, this is uh, the first, earliest known anyway, Irish scientific instrument. It's a solar observatory. It was built 5,000 years ago, uh, sometime uh, before the pyramids. Uh, this uh, is, shows you the uh, huge telescope called the Leviathan, a 72-inch telescope uh, built in Ireland in 1845, and it was actually the largest telescope uh, in the world until Mount, Mount Wilson was opened in 1917. Uh, the point I want to make is that Ireland was fully engaged in science, especially in this period, 1800 to 1922, when Ireland was part of the United Kingdom. Uh, the UK introduced universal primary education in the 1830s. There were four universities, a college of science, and then we became independent. We actually have, as some of you will know, uh, a great scientific tradition with some extraordinary scientists having been Irish or having worked in Ireland, including Robert Boyle, Kelvin, uh, George Boole worked in Ireland for many, very many years. Walton, the Nobel Prize winner, Schrodinger uh, worked in Ireland for many years. So there's a great scientific tradition which was established essentially during the period uh, of uh, British rule in Ireland. This is the Royal College of Science. Uh, it was originally founded in the 1840s, but new buildings were opened in 1911. And it was a major uh, investment by uh, the London government in science in Ireland. And then there were changes. Uh, from 1922 to 1962, we had a revolution, a war of independence. The country was partitioned. And for the next 50 years, essentially from 1922, 40 years, uh, science was neglected. So was education. So were the universities. And for many other reasons as well, uh, emigration from Ireland uh, continued. And there was economic and social stagnation. So what I want to do is to make this relationship through the Irish case. I want to relate science to uh, progress of a general kind. And what you see here is a summary of a bad period for Irish science and a bad period uh, for our country. You will all probably know that we had a terrible famine in the 1840s. One million people died and one million people emigrated from a total population of eight million. This was a devastating uh, uh, blow uh, to our country. It was, by the way, more or less inevitable. Maybe the million people didn't die, but a very large number of people would have had to emigrate. And uh, some people blame various uh, parties for this famine, but it was, in, fact, in effect, unavoidable given the circumstances. And what you see is that emigration continued all the way uh, up until uh, the 1960s. In fact, our population in the Republic of Ireland continued to fall until uh, 1961, when it reached its lowest level of 2.8 million people. It's only this year that our population has got back to 6.4 million 
uh, which uh, you can see over here. Meanwhile, Britain has tripled in population, and so has Europe. So this was a devastating, uh, a devastating uh, event uh, uh, in the history of the country. But what you need to know for the case that I want to make is that in 1922, Ireland was a relatively modernized society. Its living standards were above average for Western Europe. There was a strong economic, social, and political infrastructure. And broadly speaking, Ireland belonged to a Western European pattern of access to higher education. And this is from the authoritative History of Ireland by Joe Lee. From 1922 to 1962, we did what a lot of independent countries do. We indulged in romantic nationalism. We engaged in Republican hegemony. We adopted conservative economic, social policy, and religion. We became sectarian. We became inward-looking, isolationist, anti-intellectual, and anti-science. Just to summarize, we had three objectives. We wanted to restore the Irish language. That failed. We wanted to consolidate Catholicism. That succeeded. We wanted to reunify the north and south of the country. That failed. We had very little interest in economic development or education. And the results? Poverty, massive emigration. And here is a major review of 1958 saying the expressions of despair about the future are heard on all sides. The government, for example, did not require any scientific subject for secondary school examinations. And as late as 62, 63, only 30% of boys and 14% of girls took any science subject, and they would have included geography as a science subject. Then it all changed. In 1962, we became an open economy, very quickly, open society. We invested in education. We invested in agricultural research, high-tech industry, which I'll tell you more about. We became gradually pro-intellectual, gradually pro-science, tolerant, and education was reversed. I'm not going to go into the details, but you'll see in 1969, we established our first National Science Council. We joined the European Union. We had really bad government for seven years. We had seriously bad financial policy recession. Emigration resumed. 87, we adopted a prudent financial policy. And for the years 93 to 2000, the Celtic tiger uh, roamed around our country. And we had an average growth rate of 8% per annum. And unemployment and emigration were essentially solved. A key element in this was foreign direct investment from the United States, especially. New high-tech sectors developed, agriculture uh, was modernized. The influence of science and technology on uh, social and economic development from this period on was very substantial. Agriculture did increase in value, but look what happened as a percentage of GDP. It went from 25% in 58 to 2% in 2008. It's now a very, very, very successful sector, but it's only a very small part of our economy. And for Irish people, this is really important. Here is emigration. In 87, that terribly bad period of, of, of economic policy, it went up, but then it went down, 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 and conversely, immigration increased. And we now have, for example, a very, very large multinational uh, cosmopolitan population with uh, a very, very large population, for example, of people, highly qualified, highly uh, educated people from Poland and indeed from many other parts of the world. So everything was reversed uh, uh, during, uh, during this period. I won't say too much about it, but we invested heavily in general education, especially in 67, we introduced free secondary education. There are now seven universities, 14 institutes of technology, and very high third-level participation. About 60% of people, of uh, school pupils in Ireland go on, 60% go on to third-level education. And we are now above the OECD average in the percentage of people in this age group who have had tertiary education. It's a dramatic turnaround. We've become a technologically quite well-educated people. Not a lot, lot, lot still to be done, but we've made a great deal of progress. There have been key government agencies involved in this, and I'm going to concentrate a little bit on some of the successes of the Industrial Development Agency, which has been responsible for foreign direct investment. The scale of this has been really huge, focusing on high-value-added activities, high-skill content, food processing, which is very much a, a locally-based industry, 
and the idea, of course, to improve our competitiveness through knowledge. And we're focusing always on knowledge-intensive businesses and on the development and application, as it were, of human capital. There has been massive, really massive, direct foreign investment into Ireland. Now, why is that? Well, here are some reasons. EU membership, English speaking, you probably, many of you will know that some of the greatest authors in the English language are Irish. Very low corporate tax, now 12.5% on profits. Political and economic stability, even in the present circumstances today, uh, we are politically and, believe it or not, reasonably economically stable. And of course we have this highly educated and young workforce. So we have attracted many of the great ICT companies. You know many of these names, if not all of them. They all have major uh, manufacturing or management organizations or sometimes financial organizations uh, in Ireland. And I'll just mention uh, one in particular, Intel. They have invested $5.5 billion. They employ 3,200 people and they have over 1,000 long-term contracts with Irish, local Irish suppliers. Uh, it's an extraordinary uh, development and they've been investing further in recent times. We have many of the top pharma companies. Uh, for example, when Shearing Plow uh, came to Ireland in the 1980s, they were one of the first companies to be producing recombinant uh, proteins, and they were doing that uh, in a plant in the south of Ireland near Cork. Pfizer Wyatt at Grange Castle in Ireland, when this was being built, it was the largest biotech plant project in the world. More than $2 billion invested more than 2,000 employees, and the majority of the employees uh, have science or engineering degrees. And here you see uh, an estimate of the output of this high-tech industry. The sales from the man modern manufacturing has gone from virtually zero to more than 60 billion. Internationally traded services, we have a very large service sector now, rising very rapidly. And the traditional manufacturing, of course, has tended to flatten out. So I'll just say briefly something, if I may, about science and technology research policy. It was a very difficult time. I was heavily involved in it. I came back from America in 1970. I thought I would have a reasonable chance of doing science in Ireland. There were very many false starts, many reports. The first government white paper on science was in 1997. And then the key thing, the foundation of Science Foundation Ireland in the year 2000. And its main objective was to attract and retain outstanding scientists and engineers from all over the world. We don't care where they come from, just that they should be outstanding. It's to build and strengthen scientific and engineering research and the infrastructure relating to the strategic uh, values of Ireland's long-term competitiveness and development. It's based essentially on the US NSF model. It's 10 years old more than one and a half billion dollars, euros, has been spent so far. It makes grants to university staff, international competitive review, Irish people don't make judgments about Irish science. Significant industrial linkages anchoring the existing companies and attracting new ones. And this has built a research engine of about 3,000 people. Now that's a lot less than Siemens Corporation has, but it's okay. And they're very, very bright young people 300 individual teams, lots of publications, and not only do they spend 150 million euros annually, but they attract 150 million in external funding. So now Irish scientists, for example, are competing successfully for ERC grants. And now Ireland is in the top 20 countries overall, according to the citation, um, the rate of citation of our papers, and we are number one in molecular genetics and genomics, number three in immunology, number eight in material science. Irish science has moved into, I think, a recognizable place in the international, on the international stage. Our publications, as I say, have gone up. There's been a tremendous change in the Industrial Development Authority's investment program. They have increased the investments, the, these, on the left-hand side, you see a scale going up to 500 million uh, euros. This is the annual investment in projects involving R&D. So the Industrial Development Authority itself is also investing in R&D through uh, the companies, including many of the multinational companies. 
and uh, now uh, more than 50% of the projects um, uh, of this in, uh, government agency are focused on R&D. The value of the exports, the R&D firms, you can see over a nine-year period, look at the increase in the exports from the R&D firms compared to the so-called non-R&D firms which have actually gone down. We've shifted. The whole country has shifted steadily and quite rapidly. And that's a message, I suppose, it can be done quite rapidly. So in summary, we were a low-tech economy in 1960 with 19th century industry and agriculture. 1990 to 2000, a high-tech economy based mainly on imported knowledge. And now we think we are moving into being an inventive economy based on R&D being conducted to some extent in Ireland. Of course, you always have to rely on international R&D. Now, you may have heard that things went really badly. There was gross mismanagement of the economy by the government in this period. They went, the government essentially lost, lost control of itself. There was a construction boom, cost inflation, and so on. Just disastrous. Terrible financial crisis. But from 2008 to date, we now have what amounts to two economies. The high tech, the food industries, these are continuing to expand, continuing to export. And the state sector and the construction industry, they have collapsed. And emigration, I'm afraid, is resuming. That's the Irish safety valve. But we will be driven out of our present, uh, our present crisis by the fact that we have this high tech economy. So what are the lessons for Ireland? I like to quote Isaiah Berlin. He described science as the greatest success story of our time. So, as I would see it, and he seemed to see it, science is the most important source of knowledge in the modern world. It is, of course, changing our understanding of the cosmos. It's the key driver of economic and social progress. It's the cause of the enlightenment, and I am sure that this will be mentioned later in this, uh, in this session, leading to developments in politics and law. And it has been the basis for revolutions, as we know, in uh, agriculture and industry and, of course, communications. The second lesson for Ireland, and remembering that we didn't have a smooth run from 1962 to the present day, is that science and democracy are two sides of the same coin. The scientific revolution stimulated the Enlightenment, the age of reason. Reason was brought to bear on all matters, scientific, political, philosophic, religious. There was a rejection of dogma in science and politics and philosophy, a resolution of differences by public debate, by democracy, by law, tolerance of differences in religion. And I would put it to you that science and democracy cannot succeed without each other. And we have played games with science and democracy in Ireland. We have been a democracy since 1922, but there have been times when the strength and the, uh, the integrity of our democracy certainly has been challenged. And the final lesson I want to draw to your attention are the roles the roles that great universities and libraries have. And I have been reading Stephen Collini recently, the, a great English social commentator and political commentator, social and political historian, and he's written beautifully. And I think of universities in the sense that Stephen Collini does, cultivating independence of mind and academic freedom. And while I have been talking about science, I think the humanities are of enormous importance, and I don't see a, a, seer, a significant difference between what the students of the humanities try to do and the students of the sciences. And just in passing to mention the great role of philanthropy in the development of universities, and in Ireland in particular, a great man, Chuck Feeney, who gave nearly a billion dollars to, uh, to Irish uh, universities uh, during the rather bad period of the late 80s. So I come from Trinity College Dublin. It's an ancient university. It has an old library. I'm delighted to be here in this wonderful institution in uh, the new, uh, new library of Alexandria. I, I respect enormously the huge cultural and indeed scientific achievements of the people who have lived in this part of the world. And we can all think of Euclid and Archimedes and so forth. And I see uh, in that great tradition in Egypt an opportunity uh, for you here in Egypt and similar, uh, uh, for, for similar countries in other parts of the world to learn lessons. Um, and I think in a funny kind of way that Ireland, which was a very poor country in the 1950s, a very poor country, 
I cannot really emphasize to you. Of course, maybe not as poor as some countries that uh, we have on, uh, in, on the planet today, but it was a poor country, and by addressing some of the questions which I've mentioned, we moved uh, to become uh, a scientific, democratic, uh, liberal, and progressive society. And I bring greetings from our Chancellor, Dr. Mary Robinson, uh, and here, of course, uh, she is with uh, Dr. Sarah Geldine uh, on the occasion when he was awarded a, an honorary degree by uh, Trinity College Dublin. So I think the Irish experience shows how all can benefit from education, science, and freedom, and social and economic responsibility. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much, David McConnell. Thank you so much for keeping to time. I just want to remind our speakers that when I start to raise this uh, pink piece of paper here, that means you've got about five minutes left. And then Marwa, uh, Marwa, Marwa Abdul Rasool, are you there? Can't see her. When she raises her paper, then you've got about a minute left, and she's going to be sitting in, uh, in the front. There you are, Marwa. Okay. So next up is Professor Sharif Kandil, Professor of Material Science at the Institute of Graduate Studies in Research at uh, Alexandria University and uh, someone with a very distinguished history, dis distinguished record of contributions to both science, technology, engineering, uh, and uh, to policy making here in uh, Egypt. And I, I won't list all the many things that are here in his bio. I guess there's a, uh, a program here where you can read it, and I will say no more and pass over to Professor Sharif. Thank you very much. I'm really honored to be talking to uh, such a gather, distinguished gathering, and uh, I would go straight into the subject. Yesterday and even before, we, the common word which we heard all the time was education, education, education. And the experience I'm going to go through is on science education. And this is an experience which I would like to share with you. It has been done during the Egyptian education reform program, which took place between the years 2005, 2009, and I was heavily involved in this project. And um, this project had a lot of um, ed emphasis on changing the policies of education and was working directly with the Ministry of Education at the time of Dr. Yusri El Gamal. And it went through a lot of reforms. Number one, putting a strategy for pre-university education. And this strategy has been discussed here in Alexandria Library with a lot of distinguished representative of the community and the society and ended up into very interesting um, uh, directions. It decided to go into building, you know, sort of an, uh, national standards for education and accreditation systems, a cadres for teachers, acad academy for teachers, and professional development, and a lot of other aspects. But I'm going to take only one single aspect, and this is the program or the initiative which called Creative Science Education, and we wanted to go through science education in a different way, to make it attractive, to make it interesting to young students. Yesterday, we heard somebody talking about, you know, sort of teaching early science like engraving in a stone. That was taken from our, our heritage and our culture. <coughs> and this initiative has started again in Alexandria Library, and um, uh, we invited uh, Professor Gunter Pooley. Gunter Pooley is the one who has given the inauguration talk for the um, um, decade for um, um, ESD, ed Education for Sustainable Development, the decade between the uh, years 2005-2014. He has given the uh, inaugurating lecture in, in the United Nations on behalf of the UNESCO in the year 2002. And we adopted 
uh, some of his creation. That was, you know, sort of about 36 short stories, and the short story, stories has nevertheless more than 100 scientific concepts. Let me go through straight, you know, sort of through how this, you know, sort of was dealing. One of the short stories is the strongest tree. The tree looks down upon the worm and, you know, sort of it doesn't like the worm. It thinks that the worm, you know, sort of is useless. It just, you know, sort of um, contaminates the environment and is doing nothing. And, for, and it has a dialogue, you know, sort of its strongest tree. She feels, you know, sort of doesn't need the worm. She looks, you know, sort of very high up on the on, looks down on the worm and a dialogue starts. In the dialogue, she starts to understand that the worm has a certain job and doing, you know, sort of a biology, a biology job. And, and so the principles of biology starts there. It starts to understand, you know, sort of how, how photosynthesis work and how saccharides, you know, sort of are combined. And this is, you know, sort of principles of chemistry in there. In the story also, you know, sort of, the, it understands how the water comes up to the leaves and the capillary action and the principles of physics and, and the designs and the engineering and the economics and the, and the art as well, you know, sort of, as well as the ethics. Combined with that, there is a lot of, you know, sort of elements of sociology and psychology and sociology and systems and probably history, and most importantly, is emotional intelligence. The, at the end of the conversation, the tree, although she is the strongest, she realized that it, she cannot live without the worm being there. And this message, you know, sort of is very strong. And only then you go into biodiversity, talking to the students about biodiversity. If you start from the other end, asking the students biodiversity, it means tak, 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 tak. It's very different from feeling, you know, sort of why, why biodiversity, why you know, sort of the people has to live together and that sort of thing. And you could extend that to all sorts of Things. Not only not only that approach, you know, sort of stops at science. You could, you know, intermesh things together. You tell him, you know, sort of. You tell students that in religion the message was, you know, sort of take on the boat from all species. It didn't say only take the believers and let everybody else drown. No, it was, you know, sort of a strong message that way. And the interesting thing about that approach that it is, has an open ending because all the fables, all the stories end by, and that was only the beginning. And in that sense, it makes the knowledge there and stimulates you. Did you know that? And it gives you a lot of information. And invite you to think and to analyze and to criticize. So think about what is there, and not only that, and just act and move and take, you know, sort of what you have learned for in order to do other things and to do, you know, sort of uh, useful things for you and the society and so on. So at the end of the day, you are, you know, sort of in, in, in working for sustainability and looking, you know, sort of for where the individual, you know, sort of, and, and how it meshes with the community and, well, the whole, the whole social system and taking care into the economy as well, as well as the best practices, best environmental practices and other things. And it's mainly based on a system approach and believing that people could create new future via science and via learning and via doing, you know, sort of using science. And also it tells them that there are multiple perspectives. It's not only one solution for anything. There are so many ways, you know, sort of, of going through things. So at the end of the day, it, it teaches science, it gives science education, it makes you 
think about other things so critical thinking and gives you the skills, you know, sort of to think about things, so system thinking, as well as gives you a little bit of the attitude by the emotional intelligence and know how to go through that. I got, you know, sort of other examples as well, you know, so which I will go very quickly through. This is a conversation between a whale and a seagull. They are comparing their hearts. A heart is very big and pumps a lot of gallons and pumps only three times a minute. And the seagull has a small, small, small heart, like a pistache. I like pistache, by the way. It's, it's a, small, a small heart. And, and this heart pumps, you know, sort of 300 times a minute. And, in it, it only in milliliters, but both of them are doing the same thing. Both, both pumps are, are doing the same job. They are controlling the circulatory system, you know, sort of, and they are essential for life. If this pump fails, life stops. But this pump working all the time, where it gets its energy? You start talking about, you know, sort of food and how food gets ionized and how the ionization, you know, sort of makes potential difference and how the potential difference, you know, sort of could get electricity. And then you talk about the concepts of electrochemistry. This approach is very different from saying to the students, write the following. Faraday, first law of electrochemistry, tak, 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 tak. This is very different. This is he feels, he lives. And you could take him further. He could, you know, sort of think of clean energy and several types of energy and what energy to use and that sort of thing. At the end of the day, you know, sort of, there are a lot of stories like this, you know, sort of why apples don't fly, you know, sort of walking on water and get all sorts of things. It makes teaching of science a fun and useful. And one learn, I learned from this project one thing, that good ideas, however good, they are no good unless you work hard on making them work. They don't have legs and work on their own. So we had a lot of work, you know, sort of in, in having manuals and in having, translating the feebles and training, training the, the, um, the teachers, you know, sort of to do that. And actually we have been involved with, with the Library of Alexandria, you know, sort of in doing that in Alexandria and in other libraries in several parts, you know, sort of in Cairo, Minya, and that sort of thing. And, and having fact sheets, the important thing is how, how to put science in a comprehensible way as well as, you know, sort of videos. And the end, the end of the question is, well, did it work most interestingly that the results on a pilot scale of 1,100 kids, 1,100 students in grade five that they have done in comparison with the average much better on science, math, and critical thinking. And that was a calibrated test done by UNESCO. And it was very interesting that it's working and it's important. This testimony is, is very interesting, but the most interesting thing that you find kids saying, when I grow, I want to be a scientist. They love science. None of the people we have seen in this conference, the big scientists, they have done science without passion. They, were, they, had, they loved science. If you don't love science, there is no way to make a good career you know, sort of in that. And this is contrary to what we are seeing today. We are seeing that at the Sanawaya Amma, at the end of the secondary school, two thirds of people go to the social track, go non-scientific. And that's, you know, sort of, well, I'm, I'm, Definitely you need philosophers, but, but you, you, you don't need philosophers more than engineers and scientists and, and the rest. At the end of the day, that was, you know, sort of uh, um, a policy, the, the strategic plan for Alexandria was, you know, so wanted to excel in science and, uh, and math. And um, that was the start to go nationwide using, you know, sort of creative science education. And we here, I acknowledge, you know, sort of the cooperation and support with Dr. Hodan Mikati and the people here in the um, Alexandria Library. Now I want to go through extending the approach. And we thought of extending this approach, you know, sort of in, in teaching, for example, chemistry, catalysis. Catalysis is very important. Catalysis, if you, if you leave, if you leave molecules, you know, to react, their chance to react is very less than you do and then you put a catalyst there. If you put a catalyst, the reaction goes faster. 
about 10 to the power 4, about 10,000 times, the, the, and the reaction, you know, sort of could, could go to a certain path, certain way. And there are an investment of $1 trillion into the, the uh, catalytic or the, the chemical catalysis sort of world. And in order to, to make students appreciate that, you could, you know, sort of create a story, something like, you know, sort of um, Nadi for, uh, for nitrogen, Nadi and, uh, and Hadi for hydrogen, and how, how they come together, you know, sort of, and meet and create a bold story, and how they could meet and, and come, and, uh, and at the end of the day, uh, make uh, pesticide or make uh, drug or make whatever it is. And you tell them about that this is, you know, sort of you have to go through the energy barrier and it's an energy barrier you have to come through. And the idea of coming <coughs> through the energy barrier is simply instead of, instead of going through a high barrier and instead of going through the hill on top to the other side, you could go through a tunnel. And if you go through a tunnel, you get you know, the chemical reaction and the chemical compounds you want quite easily and quite straightforward. And you could extend that to a business relationship or a business reaction. If I want to buy a house, okay, if I go in the street and ask people, excuse me, sir, do you want to sell a house? Do you want to sell a house? Do you want if somebody wants to sell a house and he wants on the street and asking people, excuse me, do you want to buy a house? What would be our chances to meet? It will be very remote. But if we go to a place in Alexandria here called Al Ahwa Tugariya, the commercial cafe, and you sit there, you will find, you know, sort of, you will find who wants to buy a car, who wants to buy a land, who wants to buy, you know, sort of a house, and quite easily the business, you know, sort of could be done. And Likewise, you know, sort of the surfaces of the catalysts, you know, sort of are made specific. So if you want to do this particular reaction, if you want xylene, if you want benzene, if you want whatever, you could go through a specific surface. That way you could communicate and comprehend and the students, you know, sort of you could go then go in depth where the students will be with you. Okay. And, and that's why and how you categorize your reactions in order, you know, sort of to get through. Okay, I, I believe in the totality you know, sort of, of, of life and we have, we, have 100, we have 100 elements. We make them all, all sorts of things, you know, sort of all sorts of materials. And however, all of them are made of protons, nitrons, and electrons are made of, of atoms. And, and you could see that in the periodic table, some metals are sitting somewhere and uh, in the periodic table. If you go on the some side, you get the ceramics. If you add the hydrogen to them, you get the polymers. If you get a hybrid of all of this, you get the composites. And you could get articles made of these particular materials. Likewise, human beings. Human beings live somewhere in the, in the universe and they are made, composed of the same thing. They are the same composition, however complicated, but they get different features and they get different things and you could you could extend the categorization like we extend the categorization of materials for example glasses and ceramics and so on and you could go and you could dwell on that a lot and let me give you an example and how how this you know so could be categorized if you if you get if you get carbon in in a, a cubic structure or a hexagonal structure you are ending up by getting diamond or carbon, the same graphite, or get, getting graphite, the same carbon atoms gets you graphite or gets you diamond. And again, the same human being could give you, you know, sort of if arrayed and a different, could give you strength, could give you production if they are organized, you know, sort of in a certain way. And, and discipline, discipline is the thing, you know, sort of which makes the change. <clears throat> okay. In, if, if we would like to extend the approach and we go into, if you pressurize, you know, sort of a material, if you, if you reduce the size, what are you getting? The, the pressure increases. And if the pressure increases, what you, are going, what you are getting, you are getting at the end of the day an explosion. The explosion comes simply because there are so many molecules are hitting the table. And what makes the difference is actually the molecules which have high energy. The high energy molecules, the one at the very high, high end are the ones who gets you, you know, sort of the explosion and the reaction. 
And, and this is exactly, if you oppress the people, if you, if you oppress them, you end up by, you are giving, you know, sort of the brave people, the brave people are the one who give you, you know, sort of the reaction. And if you, if you look in, in who, who comes, again, the fear barrier or the, the, you will find, you know, sort of that people could go and do, and do the reaction and do a revolution. And the interesting thing that it's not only few people. If the whole society goes on, you are getting the change. And the change is going, you know, so to be there. Exactly like the molecules when they come together, you know, sort of. And here, you start you, you talking about, you know, sort of things like, um, this is a, a, a picture under the microscope. And this is the schematic way of it. And you look here, you know, sort of at the square when there was no people, and then when they clustered. This is a very interesting picture because this is to me that they are inter and intra-atomic bonding. At the, at the front of the, of the picture, there are people praying. They, are, they have certain relation, and around them, there are people of different religion, but they are still, they are all connected. And, and when they are homogenized, only then, when, you know, sort of the breakthrough was there. And you could, you know, sort of go through bonding and think, you know, sort of that there are various types of bonding where we could, you know, sort of come together. It could be, you know, sort of an ionic bond or a covalent bond or, you know, sort of, it could be, interestingly, a whole, a whole society, a whole metallic bond, which, you know, sort of gets the whole society together. Now, I would go through that <clears throat> when we get rid of the defects, you know, sort of we, we get, I, I put this slide, I teach my students, you know, sort of that the, the, um, the stronger the bonding, the harder the material will be resistant. And I could put, and instead of the structures here, I could put, you know, sort of what was there in Tahrir Square and tell them that bonding together is going to do the difference and going to make the energy and you will not be brittle. They cannot, you know, sort of break you and you change from one stage being brittle to be resistance and to be ductile. This is the message I want to say. And one, one this is my final two slides, you know, sort of, one could ask the question here, you know, sort of, can we learn from science to, from society to understand our science or from science to understand our society? The answer probably, probably it is both. We can learn from both. I would claim that okay, well, there is a slide you know coming funny, but at the end of the day, this I would claim that this approach you know sort of answers the three elements of education KSA, which is the knowledge you could you know sort of convey the information you want via this approach. And the skills, you could, you know, sort of make the students do intelligent comparison, do critical thinking, analyze what is going on. And third, and most important, give them attitude and let them, you know, sort of know that when they come together, they will be stronger. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Sharif. I think you should have. Uh you should have renamed your lecture The Chemistry of Tahrir Square. <laughs> um, next up, it's my pleasure to welcome another of our international visitors. This is Sir Peter Lackman, who's a professor of immunology at the University of Cambridge in the UK. Peter was for many years the director of the Medical Research Council's Molecular Immunopathology Unit and the founding president of the UK Academy of Medical Sciences. Peter. Uh, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'd like to thank the Bibliotheca for the invitation to speak to them, uh, not for the first time, and I would like to take the opportunity to give a rather general talk um, on a major problem uh, which affects much of the world, and the West not least, which is the rise of a movement of irrational rejection and not just of science, but of the values of the Euro European Enlightenment altogether, and the effect that this has on society. 
And I will start, since everybody's been talking about science, um, actually trying to define for you what science actually is. Um, do I have a pointer? Um, no. Science can be defined uh, as the endeavor to give general explanations, thank you, based on experimental and observational evidence for sets of particular phenomena. And because experimental evidence accrues over time, as, te as techniques get better and as science expands, these general explanations will also develop and change. Important, therefore, to realize that science is essentially an aspiration. It's an, it, it, it aspires to give general explanations rather than dogmatic explanations. It is, in the words of Professor David Hand, a process rather than a product. And this is abused by the opponents of science of saying, since science can't be absolutely certain, we who are dogmatic know better. Um, Karl Popper, famous philosopher of science, proposed that in order for a proposition or a hypothesis to be truly scientific, it must be expressed in a form that allows it to be falsified by experiment and observation. Um, and that is generally accepted, though not uncontroversial. Uh, and finally, science is distinct from technology. Uh, most ancient cultures developed sophisticated technology, China being a wonderful example. Um, but science originated probably uniquely in ancient Greece, that at least is the view of Lewis Wolpert, and came quite early on to Alexandria. Um, and the two were distinct and somewhat unrelated um, until the Industrial Revolution and coming of artificial power, since when most technology has actually been based on knowledge of science. And having told you what science is, what about reason? Um, reason certainly also goes back to the ancient Greeks and to Aristotle, and as Ismail Sarageldin told us, there was a renaissance of it uh, in the Arab world around about the year 1000, also in the Hohenstaufen court in Sicily, but it then went into a sort of disrepute for a time, and the modern era of reason really starts with the European Enlightenment, one of whose found great founders is René Descartes, and his famous quotation, dubito ergo cogito, cogito ergo sum, I doubt, therefore I think, I think, therefore I am, um, can be taken as one of the founding statements of modern reason. Elsewhere he writes, because reason is the only thing that makes us men and distinguishes from the beasts, I would prefer to believe that exists in its entirety in each of us. There, unfortunately, Descartes was wildly over-optimistic as I'm about to show you. Um, another uh, Enlightenment definition of reason, rather a good one from Samuel Johnson's famous dictionary, says that reason is the power by which man deduces one proposition from another or proceeds from premises to consequences, the rational power, discursive power. And he always gives a quotation to illustrate this, and this is rather a good one. Um, this is from Hooker, uh, another Englishman. Reason is the director of man's will, discovering in action what is good, for the laws of well-doing are the dictates of right reason. Well, there are other definitions of reason that don't agree with this. Um, and this one, I think you really should read for yourselves. This uh, is 2010, uh, uh, when we were visiting the Megalometeora uh, Monastery in Greece. Uh, they have this plaque which says that rationalism and excessive confidence in our own powers of reason is elevation to the supreme and absolute value. In essence, it is a form of disbelief, a lack of faith. It's not a simple sin, it's a sinful state of mind, sinful view of life. Rationalism is the most typical and most evil manifestation of pride, concealed beneath all our other sins, latent in all our actions, poisoning all our good deeds, leading to an absolute belief in the supremacy of the self, and finally in the inability to repent, thereby closing the doors to divine mercy. That is an extraordinary and surprising irrational statement. Um, I believe it is not the general view of the Greek Orthodox Church. It's a sort of leftover from the Middle Ages. It's certainly not the view of most other major religions of the present time. But perhaps the best definition of unreason is this famous picture by Goya, um, which is called The Sleep of Reason Produces Monsters. I would recommend the Bibliotheca to have a large copy of this in some prominent place. Um, 
because it really sums up the, the real problems of unreason. And what are the causes of unreason and the rejection of science? Now, these headings are taken from a talk by Professor David Hand, whom I thank for it, though not all the rest of it is. And the first cause he gives is ideology. Uh, that's certainly important. Um, uh, but ideology here is, is, are all alternatives to evidence-based policies. This is not just the medieval Catholic Church um, persecuting Galileo, um, but there are much more modern and quite secular examples, and I want to give you two here. One is Lysenko. Lysenko was a Russian geneticist in Stalinist times um, who put forward the view that one could adapt crops to grow at higher altitudes by a process called vernalization, a sort of extreme form of Lamarckianism. And Stalin declared that this was official Soviet science, and anybody who disagreed with it was sacked. Um, and this ideology that one has to do this because it fits in with what Stalin thought uh, were, were communist truths led to the destruction for a long time of Russian genetics altogether. And uh, the other, and, uh, and perhaps you'll find more surprising example is Freud and psychoanalytic theory. Um, the problem with Freud as science, psychoanalytic theory, is that the psychoanalytic theory can explain absolutely anything it therefore cannot be falsified because whatever you find can be accommodated in the theory. And Popper, for this reason, rejected it as science, and so even more strongly, perhaps, did Peter Medower, uh, and I have to say I agree with him. The second cause of unreason is ignorance, and that, after all, a lot of people have talked about here, that ignorance underlie and lack of education underlies most of these problems, um, and that, indeed, uh, is certainly the case and is one of the things which um, uh, uh, can be remedied and what the Bibliotheca Alexandrina is after all all about. There's gullibility. People like to believe in um, extrasensory perception. They like to believe that Yuri Geller actually bends spoons um, or can get watches to stop. It's very interesting. They never do controls for these experiments. In other words, they don't ask people how many people's watches stop during a TV program when Yuri Geller isn't there. It's an interesting lack of um, uh, quantitative appreciation. Um, he includes biology. Um, these are uh, perhaps a minor cause, but psychotropic drugs can give one very unrealistic beliefs. For example, if one believes that one is able to fly and for that reason steps off a roof, that may have very unfortunate consequences. Um, some forms of brain damage also give rise to this sort of problem. Um, Professor Hand is um, an economic statistician, and therefore he puts the misunderstanding of probability and risk, particularly into behavioral economics, that people behave unreasonably. But this is also very important to medical science, and I will come back to in a moment. And finally, and this is repeating what I've already said, is misunderstanding of the nature of science. That science is a process, not a product, that it has to be falsifiable, that it's not, a, a, it's not an alternative to other explanations. Um, as the anti-science movement sometimes believe. Now I'd like to come back to this risk business that Dr. Dave, that Professor Hand was talking about. Um, why is it that the public is so unreasonable, um, not just the anti-science movement, but much of the public, about the factors involving risk? Um, and there's a lot known about this. People are much more tolerant of risk if it's voluntary rather than if it's imposed. You take far higher risks driving your own motor car than you would accept on a railway train uh, or in an aeroplane. I, I won't discuss radon and zinc cadmium sulfide for lack of time. It's much higher when you enjoy what you've got rather than if you think it doesn't do any good. People, therefore, are very tolerant of mobile phones, though there is not entirely negligible evidence that there may be some association with acoustic neuromas, um, whereas in Europe, they reject GM food, where there is no evidence, whatever, that it does you any harm, but they don't think that they need it, uh, on which they may change their mind in due course. There are various hierarchies of activity, too. People take huge risks in sport, whether it's uh, diving or horse riding or mountain climbing. Um, they take risks uh, riding their bicycles or motorcycles. They're much more tolerant of that than they are in medical procedures, 
We have very intolerant of risk in foods and vaccines, which I will come to, they're most intolerant of. And then rightly, they are frightened of second phenomena. If you're worried that something may start an epidemic or may affect your children or grandchildren, uh, you should obviously be more careful. And this has been enshrined in what is called the precautionary principle, and I give you a relatively respectable definition of this here. Uh, the precautionary principle basically is a reason why people say do nothing. Um, if you have any doubts about anything, do nothing at all. And um, certainly in medicine, that is very false because action and inaction are morally equivalent. And if you harm people by not doing anything, you're not doing any, any more good than if you harm them by doing something. But unhappily, that is not the situation in law. In law, you tend to get sued if you do something. You don't intend to get sued if you do nothing, except in extreme circumstances. Um, the British philosopher Francis Cornford demolished the precautionary principle already in about 1908. He calls it the principle of the wedge. And I can't give you his complete argument, he says. But basically, it's a fear of not behaving justly uh, now because you're afraid you won't be able to behave more justly in the future, and as he points out, that is a, a false premise. Um, what does the anti-rational movement at the moment concentrate on, and um, much of this will be discussed elsewhere in this meeting, reproductive technologies are very traditional, and that is because most interference with reproduction um, uh, is regarded as a threat to the morals of our endangered species, which we used to be, which placed huge emphasis on going out and multiplying, and anything which interferes with this is regarded as immoral, um, it's worth pointing out that we're no longer an endangered species, we're an endangering species, and actually the growth of world population is the major problem now affecting the world, and all, unless we control that, Everything we do about climate change or securing the food supply and everything else will be completely useless. It will just delay the disaster by a finite period of time. The second, which I could talk about at length, but not in the presence of a lot of people in this room who know 10 times more about it than I do, is the genetic modification of particularly food plants uh, and also of animals and humans. Um, uh, the uh, fourth, which I will talk about, is alternative medicine. Um, and the fifth is animal rights. Um, I, I do say a word about that, actually. I put rights in inverted commas because, of course, animals don't have rights. That is a complete illusion. Um, I've only been going for 12 minutes. Um, uh, humans have duties to animals, um, but animals don't have rights. If you find that a difficult concept, Think about humans' duties not to carry, cut down forests so as to preserve uh, forests. Humans have a duty not to cut down trees, but do you really believe a tree has a right not to be cut down? Um, uh, brief words about rational medicine. Um, it's based as far as possible on normal abdominal structure. Essentially, it's based on pathology and it learns from its mistakes and it's responsive to science and in fact it's much like science itself. Irrational medicine on the other hand has no basis in pathology. It usually has universal theories of the causation and treatment of disease. Uh, since it knows it rejects empirical evidence, doesn't learn and it's extremely diverse. Um, I'll just show you a couple of examples. This is from a well-known campaigner also in the GM food, which I will not read to you about how acupuncture works. You can read this quickly for yourself. You'll notice they always bring in the immune system here sometime. Here her liquid crystalline continuum mediates hyperactivity to allergens. As a matter of fact, although all these words look as if they mean something, this is what is really described as word salad. If you put it together, it doesn't actually mean anything at all. But it is worth pointing out that, of course, until the rise of biological science, conventional medicine was due to Galen and was itself totally irrational. It was based on these four humors, and the treatment was based on restoring the balance between them, and these treatments could be extremely unpleasant and could actually make you worse. So that when in 1810 Samuel Hahnemann invented the law of likes, 
and saying that very small quantities of drugs that at large quantities produce a certain symptom will cure the disease, which of course is irrational, um, but nevertheless, since he was actually just giving distilled water, the treatments were harmless and the effects due to placebo. So in 1810, I would have taken homeopathy rather than galenical medicine. Um, uh, this is vaccination. In my last five minutes, I will talk about is the uh, most important example of irrational resistance to medicine. It goes right back to Jenner and Pasteur, famous cartoon by Gilray, which many of you will have seen before, um, where people who have been immunized against cowpox start sprouting cow heads and various other unpleasant things. But quite interestingly, uh, there was an article published in 1828 um, uh, in a small English town where somebody was to impress on people the need to have their children vaccinated against smallpox. So it is deeply to be regretted that after all the experience of the benefit of vaccination, Persons are found, some of them not in the humble class of life, who entertain prejudices which, like other prejudices, have their origin in a neglect of candid inquiry. Except that smallpox has been eradicated, you could still publish that in 2012. What, in fact, you find on the web uh, are things like this from this woman, Ingrid Castle, who runs an anti-vaccination group in the States says the most ridiculous things. Anyone with eyes to see can witness the vital health of the unvaccinated as compared to their excessively vaccinated peers. I think she wears distorting glasses. Um, I, these are a list of the vaccine scares. You know most about those. Um, and I'm not going to talk about any of those. because I've talked about them before. Um, what I really want to talk about are just two very new examples of irrationality of various sorts. One is the immunization to papillomaviruses, uh, which is new and very valuable. Um, uh, these viruses cause cancer of the cervix in females and rarer tumors, both anal and oral, in both sexes. Um, vaccines are now widely available and they are used to a variable extent. Um, there has been opposition, for example, in Germany on the grounds that vaccination would promote promiscuity. Um, and I think really trying to keep, make girls behave well by threatening them with cancer is about as unethical as you can get. Um, practically all countries, it's only issued, uh, offered to girls, that America may be changing for various reasons. That is not rational because HPV are viruses that occur only in humans. And therefore, if you immunize both sexes, you could actually get rid of these viruses and stop vaccinating in due course, like you did with smallpox. Vaccination of girls only would need to be done indefinitely, but because of the algorithms which countries use for number of deaths saved per hundred dollars spent, at the moment this is not being done. And the final example, which is an important one, is the eradication of malaria. That's already been talked about to some extent. The withdrawal of DDT was a major disaster for malaria control and at the present time, the spread of artemisinin resistance is threatening to do the same. Immunologists have known for decades that one can eradicate malaria by transmission blocking vaccination. And why has this never been done? Well, transmission blocking vaccines are against antigens that are only expressed in the mosquito. They're therefore not normally seen by the human immune system and there is no antigenic variation, which is the bugbear of all other malarial vaccines. The immunized subject can still be infected but cannot transmit, and this was therefore attacked as altruistic vaccination. You take the risk, you don't get the direct uh, benefit, which is nonsense. The real problem is that transmission blocking vaccination is fully effective only if 90% of the population is immunized, and that will require compulsion as it did with smallpox. And no political will to do this has yet been found in spite of the fact that millions of people still die of malaria. Should be trialed somewhere on, on an island where you can do everybody. And this you don't need to read. This is just to point out to you that this was suggested by a World Bank WHO UNDP working party as an ideal public good in 1999. And they said this was urgent and could be done within 10 to 15 years. Oh no, it hasn't. Uh, there was a phase one trial um, in 2008, where there was a little trouble with the adjuvants, so you got a bit of local reaction. They're going to try something else in 2011. We're nowhere near it. There is no political will to do this because people are worried, governments are worried they'll be attacked about it. 
So my conclusions, and here I'm going to quote from Adam Smith, and though Professor Ernst may be a, um, a Nobel laureate, his attack on Adam Smith, in my view, is, is quite out of place. Science, he said, was the great antidote to the poison of enthusiasm and superstition. Enthusiasm then was meant in the sense of people very enthusiastically believing irrational things. One of the great founders of the European Enlightenment. And therefore, robust and independent rational science base is essential for addressing the problems of the world in the 21st century. And the values enshrined in the Bibliotheca Alexandrina are still as topical and as relevant as they were two millennia ago when the original library was here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter, keeping the spirit of debate alive as ever. And uh, our final speaker this morning is Professor Abdullah Dar, who has traveled with us all the way from Canada. Abdullah is the chief scientist of an organization called Grand Challenges Canada. Grand Challenges is a very exciting and very in innovative way of um, describing the interface between science and policy, and in Abdullah's case, public health policy. I'll leave it to Abdullah to tell us more. Thank you very much, Hassan. I'm honored to be here. Thank you for the organizers for inviting me, and particularly to Professor Ismail uh, Saragelgin for uh, creating an incredible institution, the like of which doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. I want to talk about uh, Grand Challenges Canada, but to emphasize that, in fact, this is a policy innovation on the part of the Canadian government uh, for having had the foresight to use a very small part of its foreign aid budget to fund uh, research for global health uh, on a scale that is likely to make a difference. Uh, so it's also about innovation in serious research funding for global health. And it'll take me a little time to get to it. My, my total talk isn't very long, but to get to that point will take me a little time because I need to give you some background. Uh, a lot of this background can be found in our latest book. Peter Singer and I uh, published this book last September. Uh, it's written for the lay public, so it's very accessible. Uh, it's published uh, by Random House Canada and it's available on Amazon. And it's called The Grandest Challenge and it's about taking life-saving science uh, from the lab to the village. Predicated on this idea that the life of every child, uh, every human being, no matter where they are born, has equal value and we should therefore value it equally. Uh, and a deeper uh, philosophical premise uh, that what diminishes you as a human being, no matter where you are or who you are, will ultimately diminish me. I wish we had more time to discuss that. We started our work in the area of grand challenges with the Gates Foundation around 2003, uh, when we were approached as a result of some previous work that uh, I had done in Toronto and Peter had done in Toronto to use a particular social sciences methodology to arrive at consensus as to what the priorities should be in any particular domain. And this particular one was to look at grand challenges for infectious diseases. Uh, and having identified the 14 priorities which were published in Science in 2003, uh, Bill the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation put in about $450 million into solving those grand challenges which we defined as major obstacles uh, that stop us uh, from getting to where we want to go from where we are now. A good example of which, and still hasn't been solved, is how to make a vaccine that doesn't require refrigeration and therefore wastes 80% of the cost of delivery. I then moved on to focus on uh, chronic non-communicable diseases, which are a group of conditions that cause 60% or so of all deaths in the world in adults. Uh, these conditions cause more deaths than all communicable diseases combined, including HIV and, and TB and so on, all maternal and perinatal conditions, 
and nutritional deficiencies combined, and those are cardiovascular diseases, mainly heart disease and stroke, uh, certain kinds of cancers that share risk factors with the other three, uh, chronic respiratory diseases, and type 2 diabetes. So a huge chunk of pathology that causes the majority of deaths in the world, not just in the wealthy countries, but actually now in almost all countries uh, of the world. Uh, and having uh, done that study, which we published in Nature in 2009, Grand Challenges in Chronic Non-Communicable Diseases, and identified 20 priorities, we then went on to create the Global Alliance for Chronic Diseases, which I had the honor of uh, chairing uh, initially. And uh, that is a, a, a consortium of research funding agencies that includes the NIH and the MRC and their equivalents around the world, and together they account for 80% of all research funding for health and biomedical sciences. And then I moved on with my colleagues at NIH and uh, the Wellcome Trust and others to tackle an even bigger problem, which is uh, mental health. And uh, this uh, is a domain that is uh, misunderstood, uh, underappreciated, grossly under-resourced in terms of research and healthcare. And we wanted to bring the same kind of energy to it that we had for the infectious diseases with uh, the Gates Foundation and uh, others, and then the non-communicable diseases. And we teamed up with the National Institutes of Mental Health uh, and others, my center in Toronto, and uh, we then did the world's largest study of its kind to identify these grand challenges which were published in Nature last July and created an initiative called the Grand Challenges in Global Mental Health Initiative, which is housed at the National Institutes of Mental Health, but in addition to having research scientists involved, clinicians, hair provider, healthcare providers, it is also building a community of uh, people in the communities, including patients, who are interested in providing solutions to some of these major uh, problems, and unfortunately we don't have time to go through it. Uh, it is those kinds of projects uh, that uh, ultimately led the Canadian government to approach Peter and I to create Grand Challenges Canada, about which I'll speak in a moment. But I also want to talk about the issue of innovation and how uh, technologies that uh, 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 science and technologies that come out of laboratories and uh, research institutions can stagnate. And one of the studies that we've been involved in is to look at stagnant technologies in sub-Saharan Africa. Here's an example of a failure, a scientist who's uh, developed a, an incinerator for burning medical waste but cannot get it out of the lab because he does not have the funding to develop it further, design, uh, patenting, the system doesn't exist to support that, uh, and uh, commercialization is therefore uh, not carried out, and his knowledge and technology is stuck and cannot get out. As opposed to a success story, this uh, amazing company in Tanzania called A to Z Textiles, described in our book and in other places, uh, used to make uh, T-shirts and, and, and little baseball caps until they started manufacturing insecticide impregnated bed nets uh, about 10, 15 years ago, and now they are the largest manufacturers of such bed nets uh, with a huge impact uh, on reducing uh, ch childhood mortality from malaria. They now make 30 million a year of these uh, bed nets which sell for just a few dollars. Uh, the international community actually will help you buy them by pressing a button on many websites so that you can contribute to uh, a poor people who cannot afford them. But the interesting thing is apart from the fact that they have reduced uh, mortality amongst children, uh, 
they also create jobs. So this one company, the last time we visited, employed about 6,000 workers, of, of whom 90% or so were women, and now has doubled production, is probably employing in excess of 10,000 people. So it's contributing to good health, not only through the product, but by reduction of poverty, which we know is linked to improved health. So let me now go on to talk about Grand Challenges Canada. As I said, this is a great Canadian policy, innovation. Uh, and in the 2008 federal budget of Canada, the government created a Development Innovation Fund, and the language it used was of the Grand Challenges type of work. And it said when Sir Frederick Banting and Charles Best, uh, most of you know that insulin was invented or discovered rather uh, at the University of Toronto, and we gave it to the world uh, for free. And that's why there are many companies now that are thriving on making insulin out of that humanitarian gesture from the University of Toronto. So he said, when those two isolated insulin in 1921, they transformed the lives of Canadians and people around the world. Similarly today, scientific innovation has the potential to improve the lives of the world's poor. And the aim of the Development Innovation Fund is to support the best minds in the world as they search for breakthroughs in global health and other areas that have the potential to bring about enduring changes in the lives of millions of people in poor countries. So the impetus is humanitarian. And the innovation was to take a small amount of foreign aid money from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and say that we will put this small amount of money, which amounts to quite a lot for this purpose, but it's a small percentage of the foreign aid envelope. Uh, and created a fund of $225 million in the first instance uh, to address global health through good research and innovation, through the Grand Challenges approach. And Canada is the first country in the world to do this. And there are other countries now that are thinking of uh, approaching this in the same way. The mission of Grand Challenges Canada is to fund innovators in low and middle income countries. So 85% of the funding that we have already uh, used to fund research has gone to principal investigators in low and middle income countries. In some cases, they may wish to work with Canadian scientists and we have a small separate program for Canadian scientists. But as I said, the majority of the money goes for bold ideas that will have a big impact. So we are willing to take big risks with what we fund with the hope that uh, it will have big impact rapidly to save lives. So we go through this process of, of identifying what are the grand challenges and then funding them very rapidly, very nimbly, and in innovative ways that I don't have much time to discuss now, but that I can discuss in the question and answer session. But one of the things that we do do is, after funding individuals or individual teams, we then create a community of them by bringing them together uh, so that they can learn from each other, leverage their skills, uh, harmonize the methodologies where it's relevant and the metrics and so on. And we focus on integrated innovation. In a minute, I'll tell you what that means. And we also support the implementation of the uh, research if it pans out. So for example, if you come up with a great idea, we'd help you build a company to commercialize it. Integrated innovation is not just scientific and technological innovation, but also social and business innovation. So you are most likely to get funding from us if you bring a project that thinks about all these three things together. Uh, the idea being that we are funding research that we want to solve problems. Uh, and we want that research to have an impact on society as rapidly as possible. And so you need to think about how to get that knowledge out of the lab and we also need you to think about the social context in which that product is going to be used. At present, we have five uh, funding 
baskets or programs. One's called Rising Stars in Global Health, which is aimed specifically at young scientists within 10 years of finishing their last degree, PhD usually. Uh, we have a very large program which we have uh, uh, partnered with the Gates Foundation to develop point of care diagnostics that we're trying to develop very small uh, uh, diagnostic platforms uh, that use no electricity or very little electricity, no water or very little water out in uh, the point of care which can be in a very small village or even at home and uh, standardized in a way that it can be used on any platform. So it's a platform that's standardized to be used on multiple platforms. We have another program on maternal, neonatal, and child health. Uh, we have another one on non-communicable diseases, uh, and I'll mention just one in a minute, and then our last one, which we are developing now, is called Scaling to Impact. So in mental health, uh, after that study that was published in Nature last July, within about a month, we picked up one of the priorities and put in $20 million into it. This is the single largest injection of research money uh, at any one time for mental health, not just for developing countries, but just mental health per se. And certainly, uh, it is uh, uh, unique in the sense that uh, it's aimed at solving the mental health issues for the developing world. And the goal that we are addressing in this $20 million is to improve treatments and expand access to care and to address this terrible thing that always accompanies mental health, which is stigma. Now, uh, a few examples of this rising stars uh, program. These are two scientists from the developing world. On your left is uh, a scientist working in a small research uh, institute in Tanzania. He noticed that when children or youngsters play soccer in the evenings, uh, their socks got wet and mosquitoes tended to be attracted to those smelly socks. And he theorized that if he took smelly socks and put them in a box with insecticide, then mosquitoes would be attracted and they would be killed by the insecticides. A little far off initially, but we gave him $100,000 uh, to produce proof of principle. And lo and behold, he's gone along and produced proof of principles and showed, showed that it does work. And we have now funded him to nearly a million dollars to develop this, helped him to build a company, helping to design this and take it further. On your right is an Indian scientist from Delhi who is working on developing an electronic nose, a kind of breathalyzer for the diagnosis of tuberculosis. As many of you know, it takes six weeks to uh, use uh, media and uh, to plate out uh, sputum before you get a diagnosis and quite often it's not accurate. Uh, the hope with this gadget is that it will be uh, able to give you an answer within minutes. In the last month, we have funded another set of these uh, ideas, and what we are looking for are out-of-the-box ideas. Just one page of a proposal with a two-minute video. And if your idea is good, we don't care if you've already got uh, data or you're a great scientist with a track record. We just fund you initially for $100,000 for your idea. And if you then take that idea within a year to 18 months to proof of principle, uh, and there will obviously be many failures, but those that succeed, we will then give you up to a million dollars to take it further and further down the road, we may give you more. So here are a few examples of these rising stars, uh, scientists who are developing new technologies and new ideas. One is developing a cell phone test to diagnose pneumonia from the uh, uh, gaseous uh, output in the breath, oxygen, nitrogen, and the breathing pattern, and so on. Another one has an idea of using chicken feathers, scientific basis to it, but using chicken feathers to remove arsenic from water, and in countries like Bangladesh and big chunks of India and even uh, in Canada, uh, arsenic, which is a carcinogen, 
is a big problem in the water supply. Another person is uh, developing a uh, rapid methodology for testing for glaucoma, which is a, uh, a significant cause of blindness uh, all over the world. Dr. Karim is developing a thousand dollar technology for uh, detecting uh, uh, tuberculosis through imaging, digital imaging, very low cost. Another guy in, is developing an inexpensive artificial knee at the moment. It costs about $1,500. He's got one that's down to $65, and he's got a prototype that you can see in that picture, which actually works, and we are helping him develop that, and others are doing other things, a low-cost vaccine for malaria, some stuff for leishmaniasis. We also have a program on maternal and neonatal child health. I'm running out of time, but I've got four minutes, I guess. No? Is that one? That's fine. Thank you. One or ten? <laughs> um, maternal neonatal child health, one's called Saving Lives at Birth, where we have partnered with uh, 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 the Gates Foundation, USAID, DFID now, and uh, the government of Norway and the World Bank, and an even more exciting one called Saving Brains. I wish I had time to uh, talk about that. And then this idea of scaling to impact. How can we bring science together with the efficiencies that come out of uh, business enterprises and the focus and the accountability and the, and, and the management experience to take great ideas rapidly from the lab uh, to the village. So I had little time, but that's the gist of it. Uh, read our book for a little more on this. And uh, if you want to learn more, please follow me on Twitter or visit our website, uh, grandchallenges.ca. But we talk a lot about this on, on, on Twitter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Abdullah and thank you also to our other speakers for this first session. And particularly thank you for humoring your chairman. I know it's always difficult to be asked to curtail your presentation, especially if you spent a long time um, preparing for, for a, a particular length of time. We break now, take a short break, and we are back at, uh, I'd appreciate if you could come back to your seats at 10.55, where we will begin with uh, Professor Philippe Desmoresco, who is the chairman of BioVision. And I would respectfully ask Philippe if you could keep your presentation to about 10 minutes, because that will then allow the other speakers in that session to have their say. And then, then really it's the opportunity for the audience to have your say and to ask questions of the speakers, as well as um, to have more of a, a debate and discussion. And I'm trying to protect your time by giving you about 45 minutes in the next session. So we'll have lots of time for Q&A and discussion. So appreciate it. if you could take your seats here, please, ladies and gentlemen, at five minutes to 11. Thank you.